All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the July 17th, 2024 meeting of SIG Auth. Let's get started. We have a few items on the agenda. Uh, announcement is cold freeze is next Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024. I know many of us are busy reviewing, um, so get your stuff in as soon as possible. And let us know if you're waiting on reviews, I guess. Uh, next, we have topics from Zarya. Yeah, that's me. Um, I'm, I mostly work on the networking side of things. I'm here uh, working on a kip from the SIG network side of things. This is my first time in the SIG auth meeting, so hey, everyone. Um, I'll be quick and keep it brief. Uh, this is regarding the issue that is linked there, 99425. In the pod handler and lifecycle handler, we have a host field, which has security implications because the feature by itself means we can put any API in it and then kubelet then does probes towards that API, towards that IP, sorry. You can put any IP in the host field and that means kubelet does probes towards that IP and there are some security implications and risks and this has been a long standing issue. I picked it up to because it was also related to a kept I was working on on how can we make probes better, but that is a whole other story. But as a first step to solving this issue, on on the stated issue, there's a lot of comments. But the TLDR was that everybody agreed that this is a good candidate to use PSA pod security admissions for, where I can block users, warn users, etc. When they set the host field, and that can be a good first step in doing so. And so I have opened a PR. I also spoke to Tim um, who, on the issue and they said uh, this might need a cap or might not need a cap and this is up to the SIGOT community and that I should come here to the call to see if it warrants a cap or not. The PR is pretty straightforward and simple. I've put it in draft mode. It is 125271. Yeah, that's also there. And I haven't done any tests yet, but I wanted to ask the community if this is something that usually needs a cap because it's a user-facing thing or what what sort of paperwork is required. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I think I think this is a good candidate for a cap just because the questions that we're asking um, are exactly the types of questions that we would have in a cap. Like, where all is this used? What are the behavior changes? Um, how, what does this do when you upgrade? You know, if you have existing stuff, what happens when you upgrade? Uh, what are we locking down? Like, it, it, there is some paperwork overhead with caps, undoubtedly, but uh, the compatibility stuff is exactly the types of questions we'd be asking. And we'd want to document it for users, like to let them know what's changing and how to opt out if they want to keep doing it and how to, um, yeah. So yes to a cap. If there's an, ex I, I'm just catching up and, and it looks like there was maybe already an issue that Tim pointed to. So it's possible that there's an existing yeah. Yeah, there's an existing cap 4558, which is also linked on the agenda. Uh -huh. uh, but the 4558 is tending a lot towards what would the future API of probes look like if mm -hmm. we want to go that way. So let's say the, the next step is to deprecate it, but we don't really deprecate APIs. But so then how does the new one look like? That's where we're um, angling towards. So yeah. either we could include this in the same Cap, but maybe it warrants its own cap because this is small enough and maybe we can keep it focused. I'm I'm also lost here, so open to suggestions. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally on board with smaller focused things. If there's a piece that we want to carve out that we could like make faster progress on and not get stuck in the middle of like a redesign, especially a redesign that would still have to support the old fields. <laughs> like, yes. um, so one of the tricky things about the probe stuff I think the same types are used in multiple places and I can yeah. never remember. I, I think some of them yeah, have get run in different contexts and have different implications. And I, I can never remember like which ones have network visibility outside the pod and which ones don't. Um, mm -hmm. 
So enumerating those, I think there was some of that already happening, which is good. Uh, being super clear about like, where does this field give host access? And then coupling that mm -hmm. to forbidding it in the baseline. Uh, yeah, that was going to be my question. I think right now it's tagged as this is acceptable for baseline. And given that this is known to allow access to other areas on the node, I would have expected this one to be privileged. Were you yeah. also expecting privileged, Jordan? Yeah. So th this seems like a good candidate for um, locking down further in uh, restricted and baseline. Okay, once, then I think the maybe diligence. that, oh, yeah. sorry. Once we do the due diligence to figure out like which of the places where it's actually used, is it mm -hmm. actually outside the pod and giving that access, so yeah. Sounds like then I definitely need to at least stop these things out. And I'm also fairly new, so I'm not really familiar with when a baseline versus uh, restricted versus privileged should be recommended used, et cetera. So maybe I'll learn that along the way. But yeah. Starting with the, if you start with the kept template, um, there's like the the motivation is like a couple sentences. The goals should be really quick to write out. It's basically what we just talked about. And then the design overview, starting with those sort of defers the paperwork aspects to it and like lets us make pretty quick iterative progress on actually figuring out what is the change we want to make. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a great place to start. You could throw it into a doc for collaboration, or you can start a, a PR. Uh, docs might be a little faster to iterate really quickly on, but it's up to you. Um, but we can do that. And there's not a lot of overhead agreeing on the motivation and the goals and the core of the design approach. Um, Perfect. But, yeah, uh, I can do a Google Docs because then that means there's lesser sections than the cap, right? Like, so wait, if I do the Google Doc, then I don't need the cap, or I still need the cap? Uh, the Google Doc would just be like, starting with an easy to edit version and then we would oh. copy it into a pr okay yep okay perfect yeah thank you jordan and yep. i'll do that uh i had another question related to this actually do we have an example of wiring um wiring the checks dependent on a feature gate and were you hoping for that jordan or just the cat Pod security. Yeah, the, the pod security admission checks, as I recall, were their version. Right? Isn't that the they, point? Well, they were, but is a version 1.32 like it, it is this going to go through a can be disabled stage, or are we expecting just to have it come in? And I'm fine with it coming in, but we should all know uh, we gated then. I think we would lean on the versioning built into PSA. That works for me. Um, the only times I've seen feature gates uh, were around the restricted. So baseline um, doesn't require you to set stuff, you know, but it, it might prevent you from like opting into escalating things in your manifest. Restricted does actually require you to set things. So as we add new capabilities to lock stuff down, you might be required to like lock stuff down and set new things. So those new fields that lock down things in new ways, we wouldn't add to the restricted policy until those lockdown fields graduated to stable. So rather than making the pod security check, look at the feature gate, we just wait till it's stable. And once it's stable, then we require it and restricted. And that would be just thinking this through. That would be stable in the API, not stable in the kubelets. So the kubelets trail by n minus three. Yeah, pod security is all API level. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks for picking this up. Um, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the time. Okay, and, and feel free to update the notes. I, I was trying to listen and update at the same time. Probably missed some stuff. All right, next one. I don't know who added this one. Oh, sorry, that was me. I should put my name on it. Yeah, okay, cool. go for it. Um, 
not much to discuss here. Just uh, send a PR to define. We already defined credential IDs for JOTS, they're the JTI. Um, it, the code was quite well structured, so it is actually very easy to define a credential ID also for X509 certificates. Um, in discussion on the PR, Mo and I kind of settled on taking the SHA-256 fingerprint of the certificate as the credential ID. Just wanted to submit that to like a wider audience and make sure people are okay with that. <clears throat> There's a couple like, yeah, um, a few different alternatives. Um, the number two is kind of what we settled on. Um, number one is less expensive. Just taking the signature out of the certificate. Um, it's not sensitive, um, but it's also not standard. Like I think most places, if you're coming up with a unique identifier for a certificate, they would either try to choose the serial number out of the certificate or take the fingerprint. Do we have like references to how like various places? Like we say it's standard. Like I I, I don't have. <laughs> Any like the OpenSSL tool, I think everybody kind of rolls their own. Like OpenSSL does the MD5 digest, which I considered, but I figured, no, I'm not. nobody needs to add a new usage of MD5. Yeah. Um, um, I don't have a strong opinion. I also don't have much knowledge of like what is standard. And it's going to be difficult if we settle on something and then someone, yeah, th thank you for not using MD5. Uh, if we settle on something and then someone else is like, but I'm hashing this way or I'm pulling out the signature, I don't have that information and therefore this ID is unusable to me. Like uh, ha having like some, uh, asking whoever we can who would maybe be interested in using this to correlate with some system. Like, hey, what would, what would you use? What would you prefer? Would it be usable if we had a, SHA hash of the certificate. Like maybe doing a quick uh, question to people we know running systems who might want to correlate with this would be good. Um, so I don't know if those people are on the call here or if people who are on the call here know those people. Uh, that would be super useful information to find out. Um, I mean, and if so, speaking from the Google side, like all the people who would correlate with, we haven't built anything yet. So just... yeah. <laughs> um. so that's my only feedback like maybe ask ask and get or give an opportunity to get uh, input from people who would want to correlate so Micah David Mo yeah I can ask our people who do certs <laughs> yeah that'd be, that'd be helpful um, maybe ask that and get back to us like in a week or two or, or you were wanting to merge this. Were you wanting to merge this for uh, 131, or would it be a problem if we, um, like? I don't, I don't care. Know. I right. think um, I just want to see it upstream, and then we can you know, do backports of whatever okay. we need to get it to where we need. All right. Maybe uh, maybe let's take AIs. The <clears> people <throat> who have contacts with security teams who would want to correlate these take AIs to ask them and like give feedback one way or the other in the next few days, week two weeks, something like that. And uh, if we can get this in, like when we set up the credential ID stuff, we intended to add it for other IDs in the future, which is why we uh, sort of made it a generic thing for JTIs for jobs. So I'm happy to see this direction. Sanity check on what we're choosing for sure would be good. I'm less concerned about the cost. Like uh, we're, we're validating certificates on every request. There's a sort of longstanding goal to try to do that once per connection. Maybe if we get enough support from the Go Standard Library, eventually we'll be able to do that. And at that point, we could calculate this fingerprint um, at the same time, once per connection. Okay. Yeah, I think that was my my concern. Is I was like, I think it's fine, but it's not free. It's not like the JTI, which is effectively free. Yeah. Um, I know like open that does make it per connection they just never finished it, it... No, knowing how expensive this is compared to the actual cert verification which we're doing on every request um it would be helpful to sort of know are we doubling the cost of the cert is 
the hash like a tenth of the cost of the certain verification? Like, how does it compare? Um, that, I'd that, say rough bit. estimate would be that tenth number. I think we're not okay. doing any asymmetric crypto to calculate the hash. Yeah, if we if we want to throw like a chunky size certificate at it and just like a micro benchmark that says like the verification is this expensive and the hash is this expensive. Therefore, this is dwarfed by the cert verification we're already doing per request. That would be helpful just as a sanity check. Okay. Cool. Thanks for picking this up. Uh, maybe anyone who intends to go ask uh, security teams could throw their name on here and self assign so they don't forget. Yeah, I was also going to suggest to just put this question, maybe like a comment in the PR, but like shared in the Slack channel, the save off Slack channel, in case yep. there are people, I think people who are involved in that channel are pretty. Uh, and maybe the, have the same save off and six security mailing lists, like a lot of people subscribe to the lists. So asking that question, like we're wanting to add this info. If you have thoughts about what you would use to correlate, please provide feedback here. Big auth and six security mailing list. That I would I would hit both of them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Uh, next, Micah. Yeah. So we um we've been doing a little bit of research on um certificates for uh nodes and we're looking at how um how validation happens on issuance of certs and also on usage um when you have a when a kubelet uses the um to to get a client cert or a server cert, serving cert uses the csr api um it creates a csr to for itself um and that the authorization for that is um it's not in the node authorizer i think it's just in the the rbac policy for the node um or no maybe it is in the it is in the node authorizer there's no but there's no admission um on that on that uh csr itself in the upstream Code, there's no auto approver. Approval is generally delegated to some um, either manual or or some cloud provider aware approver. And then, um, yep, uh, upstream signer uh, just checks that the IP addresses in the CSR are assigned to the node um, and that the common name starts with system colon node colon and doesn't necessarily exactly equal the uh, server or client cert. Um, so for like a, a serving cert, it's technically possible if it's approved for a CSR by a, a node to contain the wrong CN, wrong meaning a different node's name in the CN. Um, again, th that's not necessarily like a security issue at this point, like it's not exploitable in terms of uh, someone, because someone has to approve that CSR, but a, a, a badly behaving node could, has the permission to issue a, uh, CSR with its own IPs, but not its name in the CN. To request a CSR. Yeah. To request one. That's correct. Yep. Um, and so with this PR, I, I want to well there's there's follow up that I want to do but but for this CR it's just adding to node admission um a verification that the created CSR is for the node one of the node's signers either client or server and that the CN is the actual identity of the node um it would still allow if you wanted a node to create other CSRs you could still authorize that with RBAC um, but it's just a restriction on the the build the the audit, the Kubelet's self requesting C uh, CSR creation to not set a name that isn't itself. 
So this is adding opinions specifically about our well-known signer names. So That's if correct. you ask for a CSR from our well-known signer names, the kubelet has to ask for one that actually matches its own CM. That's correct. And just so I'm clear, there would be no way if I were reusing the kubelet credentials to have an RBAC permission that would allow this. This this would not allow those credentials to do it because admission it happens after that RBAC's already evaluated, right? Right. For for a different signer, you could do right. it, but not for the not for the well-known signer. Yeah. So this is becoming opinionated about Kubernetes signer names. Yep, I just wanted to be sure that it was clear that there is no RBAC permission you could add that would allow you to do something different here with those credentials. So, okay. Um, so this is this is basically a no op for all the things the kubelet does today because it, when it's well behaved, it request what it requests. This is yep. a no op for. Uh, did you want to talk about? Um, Maybe the serving side, like yeah, here the, or... the motive. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The motivation here is that, like, for for cloud environments where you do have a, you can have an approver or or even a custom signer that can do verification of IPs, um, in, in uh, to a node. You have some external system that can verify. Yeah, this node is requesting a CSR with the correct IPs. Um, that's great. When you have an on-prem system particularly, uh, where you don't necessarily have an API to call, it's either manual or um, or you have, or it might be dynamic enough that a, a static CSV list or whatever you're using to approve CSRs is not great. Um, the or, or you are in a cloud environment where IPs can change over time on a node. Um, it's possible to get a node today without this to get a serving cert with a CN it doesn't uh, own and an IP it does own at the time of issuance but doesn't own later um which I know that that's kind of confusing but yeah owns at the time of issuance but doesn't own later and then at that later time can have it can it can have a, a cert if it again assuming approval and, and and issuance uh, go through that that might be valid for another node. Basically, the IP it, it can it can issue a cert or it can get a cert issued to it that doesn't have its CN a name in the CN and has an IP that it um, no longer has in the future. So, if you're on prem and you want a you want to prevent a node from uh, requesting IP that doesn't own with a CN it doesn't own. This is sort of the first step toward that. So it makes the CN tightly tied to the node identity so that that's exactly have right. more capabilities at a later point to say, not only are we going to require the IPs to match when we're hitting this endpoint, but also we think we're going to node foo. So the CN better be system colon node colon foo. Yeah, that could be a successive, that would be a successive change. Not, not scope to this, that might be a cap even. But for when API server reaches out to the kubelet serving cert, not just doing, yes, it's under the correct CA and the IP matches because it's in the transport level thing, but that the CN is the correct CN for this node. Yeah, and it could, it, that could be opt-in. It could be like, if if the CN is system colon node colon, then it better be system colon node colon the actual node name we think we're talking to. Correct. Yeah, okay. So that, that makes sense like as a follow-up separate effort, but this, I, I think this is a good first step just to kind of uh, put actual checks around the invariants we think we already have today. So, oh, Mo, you already have your hand. I bet it's the same question. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I was going to ask, um, how sure are we that this won't break people in some subtle edge way? And should such a change be feature gated or something? So that way, if you're working today and you upgrade and this stuff just stops working, you you have a choice of not just having to downgrade. Sure. 
how sure are we? Pretty sure. Like the node name already has to match the node name that the server thinks it has for like everything else admission does. Um, so let's imagine we had a DRA extension that was on every host. And that extension was reusing Kubla credentials to be able to have Kubla level scoping. And, and we know people have done this or tried to do this. Yep. If they were using that to request another CSR with a different common name that they would be, be going through and approving themselves. That'd be fine so, if it wasn't the well-known uh, issuer. Well, 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 yeah, I could, but if it was the well-known issuer, it would also have to have system colon node as a prefix, right? So it's two, it's two level of. Yeah, they're using a well-known, they're using a Kubernetes signer name, which we define the semantics of. They're prefixing with system colon node colon, and then using, putting something that is not the node name I don't know, that seems super far out of bounds. Like putting a feature gate here so that someone who's doing weird, bad stuff has a release to like stop doing bad stuff. Sure, like I, I'm okay with that, <laughs> but I consider that pretty far out of bounds and something I would tell someone like, okay, flip this gate off, give yourself a month or three to fix your usage uh, and then it's, going to be unconditional in the next release or two releases from now. OK. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel similarly that it's unlikely to happen. I just don't like the idea of making that person's day effectively unfixable. Sure, yeah. Uh, we we have a pattern of like a deprecated feature gate that uh, will go away in a couple of releases and gives you an opt out as an escape hatch. OK. So uh, just add a, a deprecated feature gate for this, or put it behind a deprecated feature gate. And then on by default, let it be opt out. Yep. Cool. Thanks. I like how our uh, agenda has been steadily growing throughout the meeting. It started off like basically empty. It's going to be a super short meeting. Actually, no, it's going to be an hour. The so topics always grow to the time provided. Sorry, folks. No, no, no. <laughs> this is what happens when you when the last one was in May. It, it, we're actually making good progress. Like this is better than rat holing on like one item for fifty minutes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, Richard? Yes, hello. Um, yeah, first time chatting about or chatting here. So if I'm doing the wrong thing, just tell me. I will also start by saying I know that what I'm doing is the wrong solution, but I'm still going to tell you folks I'm doing it anyway. So background context, um, I maintain this project, Qbot at Rest. It uses dynamic admission control to give you an audit log of mutation, creation, deletion events um, in managed cloud environments of Kubernetes because a certain cloud vendor make this extortionately expensive. Um, so this is basically a clutch so that you can get some level of like insight and audit log without having to pay basically your entire budget just for an audit log. Um, but there is a major downside to this. So one is it doesn't have read-only stuff, uh, which I will bring up elsewhere at other times. But also it is stupidly easy to uh, spoof traffic, to flood traffic, because there's nothing that server can do. Server in this case means the uh, mutating webhook like server. It has no way to know that that traffic is coming from the control plane, except for IP alloy lists, which, yeah, isn't fantastic. So uh, I'm here to just kind of say, I would like there to be some sort of way um, for my server to be able to know that the traffic it's getting is from the control plane. Um, 
And on top of that, I would also like it to be possible to know which control plane it is coming from. Uh, I'll give an example. It's not the architecture I currently deploy this thing with, but uh, at one point we were considering essentially running a centralized one of these, and then each cluster would write into that. So I'd want to make sure that if I'm being written to, it's from, you know, the, that it's coming from the right cluster. If it says it's coming from cluster A and being logged against cluster A, that it is actually coming from cluster A. Do you care uh, about different instances of a server within the same cluster? No, for me, the control plane is like one chunk. Like the API server is just one thing. I don't read, from my use case, I don't care whether it's API server one, four, or five. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'd be the only person who would not have that requirement, if that makes sense. Do um, you care yeah. if the um, credential is visible in the webhook configuration? So I think it would have to be, or okay. no, let, let, let me rephrase it. Um, wouldn't have to be, but I have, I have an immediate solution for you if you don't care about distinguishing between servers in a cluster and you don't care if the credential is visible in the webhook config. And that is to make the path, to bake the credential into the path. Yes, so we already do that one. I, I realize I sort of misspoke. Um, so that that is what we're doing at the minute, and it is a stopgap. Mm -hmm. um, but say the the thing I'm trying to harden against is whenever we're threat modeling this thing, we sort of realized if somebody can see any of the config of the cluster, yeah. then it's game over. They can just flood this. They can fix stuff. They can just really give the blue teamers a really hard time. Um, so something like. I mean, MTLS for me would kind of be quite nice, as in like that we already know the Kubernetes control plane has a CA, it already has certs, if I can just verify against that. So I will tell you, this is possible today, but I bet the cloud provider doesn't let you set it. So admission Correct. records provide a spot where you can specify the configuration for the credentials that you want. MTLS is possible, tokens are possible, uh, and it is, per webhook, and it can be then verified on the other side. Um, but if you don't have access to your control plane to set the argument, you probably cannot set that. It's not actually Correct. per webhook, it's per backend destination, which is almost the same thing. Almost the same thing, that is true. Uh, <laughs> the other way I can think of to do this today, uh, so I guess for your use case, it doesn't help, but the option is there. Uh, is that if you do the wire as an aggregated API server locally and then run through, you effectively credential to yourself and verify at the QAPI server. And then your, your local service in that cluster would know which cluster it's on and would know that it was valid. Sorry, run that one by me again. <laughs> David, I think you're referring to the generic admission server, right? The one I linked from OpenShift? Yep, it is one way to do this um, because those credentials are automatically supplied. So you point you point the webhook config at Cube API server itself. Yes. Yep. So then and... it calls to itself with admission, but to a group version resource that actually gets proxied out to your server as an aggregated API server. It's yes. um, it's what's a what's a generous term? It worked. Uh, advanced. It, it worked. <laughs> advanced. You just you just import the library and use it. You would have to rewrite your what a little bit. It would be one. It would be one way to do it, right? Um, and that is that effectively ends up wired for free in the way the QPI server works. Um, it seems like 
in terms of longer term solutions, it seems reasonable. Like if no other credential is configured, we should send some sort of error token issued from the same place all the service account jobs are. Yeah, uh, that would be my approach, but. Yeah, so to, to clarify, or just to chime in on the, the things that have been mentioned, uh, you're right, if I control the API server, I can do much nicer things. Um, I hadn't thought of extending the API to do this. That might be a nice clutch for now. <clears throat> but I do think just as a general thing, there should be something that says what this is coming from. Um, I'm not asking for it today, tomorrow, but it, it just feels a bit odd. So um, we, we would not send a token that is shared. It would need to be a token. Not. We would token per destination. Token. Um, also, yeah, the, the Cube API server wouldn't mint a token. That so Cube API server could do that. Other API servers that are also responsible for calling admission could not mint tokens. They could request tokens. Um, so admission is enforced by the server that actually has the resources. Yep. So when you have aggregated API servers, request comes to Cube API server, gets proxied out to the aggregated API server. That API server is the one that calls out to admission. And so that API server would be looking at the webhook configuration saying, oh, someone registered a webhook that wants to be informed of all rights to all resources. Therefore, I serve fishers and flunders and wardles and whatever our example aggregated API, API server does. Um, I am the one that needs to call out to this webhook. So I now need a token. And I am not Cube API server, so I cannot mint this token. I could maybe request one with a service account token request, maybe. Um, but we can't assume that the server, all API servers calling admission have the ability to mint unique tokens. So a random aside on this, I, I don't remember the history on this. Why did we build it like this instead of like having it like an admission review API, like we have token review? Like, why did we? There is an admission review API. What do you mean? There is an admission review. Am I forgetting? That's what we send to web admission webhooks. What do you, what? Oh, right, right, right. We do. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting lost in my head. I'm trying to remember. So, so, so if you try to find something that's peer to this or something similar, right? We have webhooks for say authentication or authorization, and those allow you also to specify credentials to use. But those credentials that are used to reach out are not specifiable via the API. And so this is currently peer to our other books. Yeah. Um, the, the most likely approach to me would seem to be to say, like, use service account credentials to call out to this webhook. And then Cube API server could mint a token because it, it can mint service account tokens for the audience of the service it's calling out to for admission. Mm -hmm. And aggregated API servers could request service account credentials via the token request API for the audience of the uh, service mm -hmm. that they're calling out to. Like all the pieces are there. You could authorize those aggregated API servers to request those tokens. Um, like the, that seems like the most likely approach to me. Is a service okay. account the right identity? Like sh should it be system colon API uh, server? If this were Greenfield, probably not. But it's a thing that we have that is identity that is known that supports things like audiences and has an API for getting tokens. I probably wouldn't build a new way for aggregated API servers to get tokens for audiences. I don't know. Well, I mean, what I'm wondering is what like, do people who make aggregated API servers actually implement webhook support? Do we have some yes. sort of library? So, yes. We the, publish it. <laughs> the the Kate's API or Kate's IO API server library by default sets up uh, mutating and validating and now cell based yeah. uh, admission. Why are we so helpful? 
We're uh, helpful people. <laughs> it's a core library for like, hey, you want to have an API server that can serve a cube resource model. Yeah. So of course it does these things. Yeah, I mean, that, that's where we put it. Like when we build it into Cube API Server, the place we put it is in the generic API Server library and then Cube API Server inherits it along with all the other API servers. I would be interested, Jordan, in what identity you would choose for the Cube API Server to identify us. I guess it's Kubernetes default service. Well, there's no service account there. Yeah, what service account would you like best for the Cube API Server to identify as? New one called API Server in Cube System. Because that's probably approximately correct. I don't know. I thought about but this. I think the more interesting question is, what service account would aggregated API servers be using? Oh, the one they're running as. Who says it has to run as a service account? Uh, the API. Well, OK. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Yeah. You can give it um, <laughs> that, anyway. Now, now this is the topic. This is the topic we're going to rat hole on for the rest of the video. Uh, I, yeah, I will say I find it an interesting idea, but it's not one that I would devote my personal review time to. Yeah. Uh... Go ahead. You got the. You got the hand. I was just going to track back a lot because, um, yeah, I hadn't realized that was going to be quite such a rabbit hole. Um, I just want to flag, even if we did the loopback thing, it doesn't actually change anything. There's nothing, like, even if you do the loopback, as far as I can tell, those requests wouldn't get anything what in those requests would get? Yeah, it's, it's MTLS. It's MTLS, so it, it is oh. the user. Uh, okay, okay. You, you I, can I, very clearly I, identify from your admission webhook at that point that you are talking to Cube API server, and those credits cannot yeah. be fake, and they're very easy to uh, dynamically load because they're in a config map, the state parts yeah. are. That's, it all just works. Um, it's okay. kind of hacky. But it does work. Yeah, the, the bit that I'm worried about with that one, just to flag, is um, for the aggregate. So, no, that should work. Basically, the, the one of the main reasons I went down this rabbit hole is because I wanted to make sure that if the, if the uh, webhook server is down, we don't take down anything else. Right, like this. This was done as a cost reduction thing. It was done to save money. So if it breaks, we just keep going. Heck, yeah, we're losing all the read-only traffic anyway. You break discovery when an uh, a um, aggregated API server goes. Through. Now, now to be fair, any well-written client is supposed to understand that partial discovery is fine and is not supposed to blow up. But most clients are dumb as dirt, and they will blow up. Well, it's not exactly fine. Like. You try to delete a namespace, the namespace deletion is going to hang until we can verify yeah. all the resources from all the aggregated API servers are down. Like it'll it'll sort of go into back off, it'll retry. Like it's not going to hard block, but it will block deletion of the namespace until it can verify those resources are gone. So that's that's sort yeah. of what you get when you wire up aggregated API servers that aren't really serving any resources. Yeah. So that that would be my concern, right? And again, that's where I would say I I don't really mind how it's how it's done, but um, I, as I say, I, I think I might end up writing that for now, just as a like less terrible workaround. Um, but I don't think that's the long term. Like that's, I don't think that's the long term pattern for this, because I do think there is a like reasonable use case for uh, web hooks with side effects, which is kind of where all of this comes from because I'll, I'll give a different example say for example you are doing like batch processing you've got some kind of quota system and you're doing it through the validating webhook which to me seemed like quite a nice way of doing it like if you've quota left you can you can spin up workloads if you don't have quota left it just gets hard blocked that needs to know whether it's being spoofed traffic right um 
but yeah, as I say, don't really mind what it is, whether it is MTLS, token based, whatever. I think very few of these will care too much about what it is that's re responding. Sorry, back to Jordan's original point. Do I care what it was that responded? No, but I might want to log it um, yeah. so that, you know, in terms of the aggregated stuff, the service count thing might be a nice, you know, at least then you've got something that ties back to something that you can say, ah, yes, it was this server that did it. Because frankly, I forgot about aggregated servers. Just as an aside, uh, webhooks with side effects um, are not allowed anymore. <laughs> uh, so like in the V1 API, uh, you have to say like, does this have side effects? And the yeah. only supported uh, value is no side effects. Uh, so, I, I understanding the identity, avoiding spoofing, like all of that, uh, like is attractive to me. I, I'm on board with that. But like the specific thing, like I'm gonna make writes in response to what's sent to me. It's a really bad idea, and you shouldn't do that, even if it's the right identity. Anyway. Yeah, I, agreed. Um, I, I guess the challenge is again, managed Kubernetes. Like if, if, if you're running all of it yourself, then you don't need to do a lot of this, but unfortunately like very few companies of, should we say small to medium scale are running it themselves, at least in any good way. And that's where you get these sort of edge cases. Yeah. Anyway, thanks folks. Um, I'm not looking for anything more out of this. I just wanted to let you know there is this bad, 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 bad pattern out there, and it's my fault, and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're in, you're in good company. Uh, you talk so about bad things, which are our fault. So there you go. I so hope whoever, whichever cloud provider it is is sitting there going, "Well, now I know why this cost reduction on my part didn't help." <laughs> I, I, I don't know who's on the call, so I don't know if I can name, name and shame. Uh, you have all of them on We're the all here. It's all of Damn us. Damn it. <laughs> well, then I can I can definitely say whoever's fault it is is on the call. <laughs> anyway. All right. All right. Uh, do we want to do the... Test grid stuff or flakes? Um, Before that, I want to know whether anyone has reviewed the combination of mine plus Jordan's PR for uh, authorization based on label and field selectors. And if not, like Jordan will review my half and I will review Jordan's half. Uh, so I have reviewed it quite a bit and so did Joe. I think it's fine it's bigger than i thought it would be when we talked about the cap but i've come to the conclusion anytime you touch cell the code is like dramatically larger than you expect to do something what appears to be straightforward uh, uh yeah but it it seems fine um i think i had asked jordan for some extra tests uh, that are more end-to-end -end style to make sure all the disparate pieces are nice um yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll get the test added hopefully this afternoon. Um yeah. Thanks. If if we reach the end of the agenda, I have one question. That is just a general question, maybe someone with history would know. Um so at Cloud Native Security Con I watched a presentation on a thing called open fine grained authorization, which made me think about, oh, how do we do our back authorization in QPK server today? When I looked at the code, it's kind of spread over a couple of packages, whatever. It seems like we load every single cluster role binding and just go over them one by one for every request. Is that ever been a problem? Um, I do remember a customer issue when they made like a million role bindings in one namespace and then they could no longer do anything functional in that name. And then when uh, they deleted all of the role bindings, it worked again. <laughs> they're they're cached, so it's it's based on an informer, so it's a local cache, so we're not fetching them every time. We yeah. are iterating over all 
cluster role bindings and all role bindings in the names for namespaced requests. Um, it's been an issue in insane clusters. It hasn't become an issue yet in sort of normal clusters, but there's obviously opportunity to do indexing and like a try. Like there, there's definitely opportunity there to optimize it. It just hasn't ever been a high enough priority to make it happen. But if someone wanted to and like could carve it out, we could weigh it against the other, the all the other top priorities and maybe do it. Like I'm not opposed in principle, but it just has never been a priority. It's not a, I was just curious. Like, yeah. I was thinking, oh, well, you know, what sort of weird indexing do we do? Maybe open FGA, we could take some of their packages. I was like, oh, well, never mind. We no, don't do any indexing anyways. <laughs> yeah. uh, it turns out the naive implementation from 10 years ago has held pretty well. So <laughs> we put all our weird indexing in the node authorizer. How about that? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the RBAC authorizer is pretty straightforward to read once you figure out the pieces. It's basically just a for loop. It is. Uh, yeah. If it became a problem, like in reasonable clusters, we'd be willing to bump up the priority. I did. I did. I considered like just doing a no op refactor. Like there's a lot of visitor pattern stuff there, which I think is not actually doing anything because it is just a for loop is it uh, like uh, for a reason or just that was jordan it there was, was a reason case. i can't re it was like eight years ago so i can't remember why right now there definitely was a reason but i don't okay. remember I, th I thought it was because uh you wanted to short circuit in certain cases like Aut Z, but not short circuit cases in other cases. Yeah, I noticed as I started picking into it, I was like, okay, it's not quite as simple to get rid of the visitor pattern here as I thought it was, because there's like two different modes it's being used in from different. Like one places. is one was what are all the permissions I have, and one was yeah. do I have permission to do X, and you want to short circuit and not reallocate. Maybe it was an allocation thing where like. Returning, I, I can't. I can't remember offhand. Okay. I'm pretty sure it was allocations. If you want to change it, write a benchmark first. Okay. All right. That leaves three minutes. Um, go look at some PRs. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.